Thank you to Herman Marshall Whiskey for sponsoring another episode of Suds with Luds. Herman Marshall produces small batch, handcrafted, and award-winning whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels. Whether it's their Texas bourbon, Texas rye, Texas single malt, or their blended bourbon whiskey, all are built from the grain up, just like good whiskey should be. Make sure you ask for it by name. Thank you again, Herman Marshall Whiskey. Welcome in. Kind of a coming back party for Suds with Luds. I've been uh, vacationing for three months up north, and uh, no better way to come in than the, my favorite guys to play with in the league than the meatheads, the, the enforcers, the roughnecks. This one's a little different. Um, Billy Heward is... Uh, Falls in that category of the ultimate teammate, and I'm sure, Huey, you're going to tell me that all you guys are like that. But um, I do have a couple stories about you, Huey, that we may touch on a little bit later that you'll be interested in rehashing a little bit. But anyway, Bill Heward, uh, 12 years in the NHL, uh, labeled as a, an enforcer. But uh, welcome, Huey. How you doing? Slotty, what's up? Doing great, man. It's uh, finally we aligned. We were out there during the playoff season, and we were cheering on our stars, and I lost my voice, so I couldn't come into the studio. So I'm glad we were able to do it virtually anyway. So my apologies. Are, are we going to get the real story on that, how you lost your voice? Yeah, because no. uh, you were going pretty hard in the suite that night, not not drinking or anything like that, just telling your stories and being you. So I thought maybe uh, something half happen after i left no 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 it's kind of like a trade show when you're when you're not used to talking that much you lose your voice i think maybe old age is get kicking in too a little oh here let's not go with the old age thing you can all see you guys say that shit like when you're around guys like me that are older than you <laughs> so that's a little it's a little dig i think <laughs> billy what do you how, hey how do you you're out in california mm -hmm. and um how do you how do you like that life out there i like it i mean it really suits my lifestyle right you know I, I live in an area where I can get on my mountain bike in the morning and hit the trails and things like that. Um, you know, obviously, if you don't get involved in the politics of, of California and, and things like that, then it's uh, a lot more enjoyable. But my, my kids have grown up here. <laughs> this is what they call home. You know, Colton and, 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 my, and my kids come home from his hockey season. He's happy. I mean, he surfs. He grew up surfing and things like that. So it's a long way from Canada. But we've called it home for for a number of years. So I'm pretty well since retirement. Uh, you you say get away from politics. How how the hell do you do that in in that state? Because it, it just seems like I, I I'm not a guy that watches a ton of the news. But um, and 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 to be honest, I I've never I've never even voted. Um, and I think it'd be a travesty if I did because I don't follow it enough and. I, if you said vote for this dude, I'd probably vote for that guy, not knowing any of it. Mm -hmm. But but how do you separate yourself? Like, do you, do you just not not tune into stuff, or do you, do you do you get into conversations where you do express your opinions, or you just avoid the whole the whole topic? I mean, I think I think, in, and it's a touchy subject, you know, politics. But for me, I think people hear or read or listen to what they want to listen to. So. If you're on one side, you only watch this news station. If you're on the other side, not a lot of people listen to both. I find myself, I, you know, I try to get engaged in as little as I can first and foremost because I'm, you know, I'm not. In, that's not my world. But I do, you know, I listen to both sides and I try and stay neutral. But I think what what's happened with politics, and I don't know if it was um, structured in such a way, but you know, for me in my mission in life and things like that is. You know, it, 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 it restricts you from reaching people. So if, it, you know, I always say this as an example, where I mountain bike, we've had a mountain, we've had mountain lion attacks and things like that. We actually lost a, a gentleman in 2004. If you're on your mountain bike and a mountain lion is on top of somebody, or, you know, you're not asking them what, what side are they Republican or conservative? <laughs> you're helping them, right? <laughs> And I just think that's what's happened. I just think people uh, people can't agree to disagree, and it's uh, it's just it's it's altering relationships or people that you could otherwise reach or, or build friendships with. So I kind of stay clear of it, to be honest with you. I mean, obviously, we all have our certain there's certain things that 
you know, as a believer for me, there's certain things that I, you know, but I'm open to discussion and everything else. So I, I try not to go down that path, but when I do, I don't want it to, because I, I've seen families separated from that. And it's just, it's, it's craziness. So to your point, Lutz, uh, I think sometimes just keep the news off and uh, stay neutral uh, with, you know, with your own beliefs and, and, and don't push them too hard on everybody else. That's the way I look at it. And that's, that's how you can survive in California. I do believe everybody's leaving California. They're going for Texas and they're going to yeah. Idaho. But I think staying here in California for me is a good thing because there's a lot of people that need help. And that's the way I look at it. I look at it in a positive way. Yeah, I kind of, if I'm watching something like that and it's something that I you know, obviously don't know too much about or I completely disagree, I just switch over to, to Channel 48. Uh, actually, maybe it's 68 up here, but they're down here, I should say. It's uh, the Game Show Network. Yeah, exactly. So I, and, 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 <laughs> and a lot of the shows I watch are from the 70s and exactly. 80s. So, and then you, you know how bad I am on the Game Show because I like to get yeah, things right. Yeah. I And I watch uh, the guy with the, Regis who wants to be a millionaire. Yeah. And they ask these questions. And I nail the first five all the time because, Jesus, a four-year-old could yeah, answer yeah. the questions, right? They want to give them their $1,000. And then I pause it when I don't know it. And I ask Google. <laughs> and so I say, hey, Google. <laughs> You're batting a so, thousand. So I get, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I get the answers all the time. Hey, you mentioned a mountain lion when you're riding your um, your little pedal bike there. Uh, and we'll get into the bikes with the motors on it too. But uh, do you carry anything with you? No. Uh, you know, in case, uh, uh, you, I do. Uh, when no? I do when I do solar rides back deep, I just have I just honestly I, I don't carry a sidearm or things like that. I do have them, but I don't carry it. What I carry is I just carry like bear spray, like and that way. If uh -huh. I do get in, you know, like, you know, I mean, typically they say, I mean, there's chances are, you know, are so slim. It's like getting hit by lightning. But I mean, you do see those videos where a mountain lion pops out on a trail and starts walking towards you. So I do <laughs> want to have something. I mean, I'm a big guy. And if you make yourself up, but uh, the, the lady that's actually picking up my dogs today for a week while I'm up in Canada, She's seen two mountain lions two weeks ago, all in like within two days, and one was right next to her. So they're out here, and you know, people are moving in around this area, and we are in the, you know, we are backed up to a, a huge national park. However, uh, you know, we have a lot of fires and things like that that push wildlife in our neighborhoods a lot. So typically, the mountain lions all have collars on them out here, Luds, so they kind of can follow them and stuff. Certain times they don't, but yeah, I do. I carry me, I carry bear, bear spray just in case. They should put them shock collars on them. Maybe that would help. Yeah, I don't know. It, it Give does, you guys all a button. It doesn't help my cattle dogs. So I don't know if it'll help them out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, earlier you just you, you mentioned your son, Colton. Um, can, before we get into yourself, uh, how's he doing? And uh, a little bit about his journey. I, I think you said he's going to attend uh, the Blues Camp, right? Yeah, he went to the Blues Camp. Had a really good camp. Um, and I know he went out. He, uh, I know that. I think he went out for dinner with Al McInnes and Kachuk, and they had a really good conversation. And uh, I think they're gonna they're high on him. And you know, you know how it goes. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of things have to line up. But he's a free agent at University of New Hampshire. He's going into his third year. He's had two really good years. Just a big offensive right-handed defenseman. That's that's uh, you know he's he's got the uh, he's got the skill set and the mindset to play at that level, but. He need, definitely needs another year of college. So they're going to track him again this year. They got um, Glenn Wesley, I think, works with their defense. So I think they're going to watch him, his videos and stuff, and kind of help him and things like that. That's what that's that's uh, what he told me. So he's uh, he's fired up, you know, as a free agent. And uh, the team's going to be, I think, marginally better than it was last year. I mean, they, they went two months without winning a game, so it's pretty hard not to be. But... They're in a tough division. I mean, when you're in New Hampshire, you're up against BU, uh, Boston College, Northeastern, and you played at North Dakota. Like, you know how hard it is to get Boston kids to play at New Hampshire when they all want to play in Boston, mm -hmm. you know, Harvard. And so, yeah. But it's been an absolutely perfect spot for him. He, he was in a tough spot. You know, when he became available, when he was, you know, in, in terms of scholarships and going to D1, uh, COVID hit. So all the seniors got an extended year. So he was talking to BC and certain colleges, but seniors came back and that gap closed. So there was only a few schools that really showed interest and UNH really stepped up. So we're thrilled with it. It's been great. Well, I, I think he's he's going to a good organization for sure. And, and we know Doug Armstrong and uh, in my opinion, Army is one of the top 
uh, two, three general manners in the NHL, and he gets it. Um, and, and as a, as an organization, uh, they're not really, you know, they got all these terms now. Uh, they're not in a rebuild kind of thing, but they're I think they're in a retool. And so uh, basically, you know, and there's a couple of young guys that are going to start counting on that. have got big contract kicking in this year. And so, you know, and I think Army's that kind of guy that understands, hey, we've got to add a couple different pieces. And we got some younger pieces and they've got some guys to build around. They do have some defensemen, Perico, Krug, things like that, that, um, you know, some veteran guys. So it's a good spot. Um, so... <sighs> Billy, I, I want to ask you, you know, when we were playing together, <laughs> I want to know how whatever happened to Hugh Dog's hog. I don't um, know what happened to it. I sold it. <laughs> Did, what? I miss it. I, I, I do tell. miss I do miss the bite, but have you ridden lately? Yeah, I yeah. mean, when's the last time you got tore, on something with a motor? I tore my uh I, I tore my uh what is it, my hip flexor three weeks ago. I got into this in drill riding, so I'm on a 501 husky like a dirt bike but kind of a street bike dirt uh -huh. bike so uh that's what i love i mean i mountain bike and i dirt bike i love it absolutely love it it's just getting out the, for me it's about getting out it's kind of like road bike versus mountain bike you know harleys and things like that you know like that we had were, were a lot of fun but i really enjoy just same as mountain bike just getting out in, in the woods and just and just having fun you know I uh, I remember the first time when 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 Billy got traded here and um, he wanted a bike and he wanted to ride with us. We had seven, eight guys, nine guys, whatever it was at the time. And I don't think Bob Ganey, our general manager, would be real fired up about all that. But <laughs> I remember the I remember the day that Carbo wasn't it Carbo that told you that you could use his bike and take it for a ride. Yeah, <laughs> was it? Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. And you laid it down. You laid it down in about a block or something. Yeah, I. Uh... <laughs> He just had his tanks painted with the Stanley Cups, I think two Stanley Cups or three. Yeah. And he goes, Yui, you know, make sure you don't, uh, you know. And I said, hey, just give me it. And I pulled into an establishment I probably shouldn't have been visiting. And I hit, uh, I hit, loose, I hit loose gravel and I hit the front brake, which, as you know, lets you ride all the time is a no-no. And, uh, and then the next day I took it. And I remember me and you talking. I'm like, dude, what do I tell him? And I think you told me, you're like, just, you know, the sprinkler systems come on and, you know, in your neighborhood or something. So that was my story. But I mean, that, la that story lasted all of about 30 seconds. And uh, anyways, it went, it wasn't so much, you know, the, how, how much it costs. It was, he had to wait again for it to get repainted. So, but that was a great group of guys. I mean, that was, that was a special, yeah. you know, and, and me going there, I just kind of wanted to fit in with, with, with that group, you know, and, and you know, in terms of more than hockey and and that you know i mean i got there and the new he came in it, it was just a special group of guys there i i remember <laughs> you were scared shitless i think at the time and it would have to be a future hall of famers bike that you laid oh out on a stanley Dude. cup and captain of the montreal canadian but i there's there's one more one but before you got your bike before you got that bike and you 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 mentioned it you said in an establishment you probably shouldn't have been it well we've all been in those wrong establishments. And I know the first time that a bunch of us went to one of those places, you didn't have a bike at the time. And you had your, you had this little uh, Chevette or some little tiny car. car that you did. You look like, oh uh, yeah, you look like you were in a clown car. So, I mean, you didn't fit in the thing. And, and so we all pulled up to the front and we're all getting out. And I said, hang on, Huey's parking, whatever it was, a little wagon that you had. And he's parking in the back and we waited and we waited. And I'm like, well, what the hell's he doing? So I walk around the side of the building looking for you, and there you are, and you kind of stuck your hand out the window, and you said, hey, hang on, I'll be right there. You got out of your car. You had your Harley gloves on. You put a bandana <laughs> on in the car. <laughs> No, I didn't have I didn't car. have the gloves. Or, no, what happened was oh, you had the fingerless gloves on. No, I, you wanted to come in like you were riding in on a no, Harley. No, I came in. No, I had the boot. What happened was <laughs> yeah. I ordered my Harley, but I came in with a coat and the boots that I bought. Which, by the way, the first ride with our Harley, I burnt the heel off that boot. <laughs> rookie <laughs> we walked oh. into the apple and i started limping i'm like what the i looked down and we pulled up to the bar to have a beer and i went to go to the bathroom and i started limping into the bathroom but that was a good that was you know that's the kind of group we had though i mean that's why how you guys want to stand on the yeah. cup though honestly yeah yeah um so let's let's get into this uh billy 
you have a book out and and I got it right here and it, you know, it, it's uh, I read the thing um, and it, it there's parts in here that you know that blew me away and there was you get into the book a little bit and I was a little whoa what and uh, you know a, a purpose worth fighting for um, so can, can you tell me First off, when did you finally say to yourself, and we can go back in time after this, but when did you finally say to yourself, I I'm going to write a book? Because I don't think it's, you know, it's funny, because, and I'm glad you did, because I've had three or four people ask me, and there's a guy right now currently that wants to do it, and I'm like, man, I, I'm not that interesting kind of guy. And he goes, yeah, you got good stories and all this kind of, this kind of stuff. But so what does it take to get to the point where you go, I need to tell the story? So uh, that's a great question, Luds. I started the book. <clears throat> I started the book kind of when I first retired. I was kind of like a bitter retired hockey guy. I was like, you know, I had, I, I had, I've overcome everything to make it to the NHL. I was never drafted to junior, and I have all this in the book. And, and you know, my my first uh, the draft. I went down to the draft table. Uh, they they thought they uh, the Rangers thought they drafted me, but they didn't. But me and my dad sat there for so long in Detroit. I just went down to the draft table and went up to New York Rangers, up to Esposito, and asked for a trial. You know, there's certain elements it, within my life that I continue to strive. My first NHL game wasn't. I had to leave the ice because they didn't have me under contract. That's in the book. I have several stories like that. But what it, what had happened was. I started the book almost like a fine wine. I started the, the book and I was a bitter retired NHL enforcer. That why did I have to be that guy? I wanted to grow up scoring the goals. Um, you know, I felt like my dream had been stolen, and I was dealing with a lot of uh, anxiety and stress. I was in, I was depressed. I was going through a lot, and just the transition from NA, from you know from retirement to post hockey, as you, I'm sure you're aware, it's not an easy one. There's only so many jobs in the NHL for guys. And then, and then you have only so many guys that have enough money to retire. And then you have the other group, uh, like yourself, that's had such a long tenure that you can make a, a decent living and do great in, in terms of uh, uh, branding yourself, you know. And and you, you know, and, and but I didn't win two Stanley Cups. I you know I didn't I didn't have the accolades like like you did and certain other players. So, anyways, the book. Going back to the book, I just started writing and I've been writing for uh, almost 20 years and then two years ago um, three almost three years ago I sold my company uh, I was co-founder in a company that we sold and I had the means to I, I always wanted to write a book but I wanted to do it the right way and I had the means to do it the right way and I said that's it and not only that, Luds, it was time. I'm like, I need to start reaching other people. I've seen so many NHL players that have went through hardships, are still going through hardships. I got a call last night um, from a gentleman just in terms of a retired hockey player that called me and said, hey, man, I made it through July 4th, and I just made it through the long weekend. You know, it's just certain things that guys struggle with. Anyways, I wanted to give back, and I thought, I'm going to do this. It's not about you know, obviously I'll monetize a book, but it's not so much about that. Then I started to realize hockey was really just a vessel for me. There's so many other people outside of the sport that struggle with anxiety and mental issues. Corey Hirsch wrote a book and things like that. So I just said, that's it. I'm doing it, Luds. And that's when I, uh, I had, but in order to do it, I had to have two feet in, uh, you know, I had to be, I had to be the person I, the person that wrote, the person that I'm writing about in the book, I had to be, I had to live it. And it's uh, it's been a great journey. It's you know it's just beginning for me. The launch is on the twentieth, but I just think that you know we'll go deeper into this. But I just think it had finally come to a head for me. It's like I told my wife I'm doing it, and she's like, well, if you truly want to do it, because when you read my book, there's a lot of stories in there that you know somewhat have collateral damage, or your wife's reading it, or people are like you read it, and like man, that's. So imagine my wife reading it, going through the hardship. She doesn't want to revisit things like that. But in order to do that, in order to in order to heal, first of all, for me, but in order to help others, I just laid it out in the line. Here's here's you know, and, and with no blame on anybody, or obviously not blaming the sport, but here was my life, you know. Well, it sounds like it was very therapeutic for yourself. It was. It, it's healing. I mean. <clears throat> 
all of its healing. And I'm, you know, I'm, even me monetizing it now just on LinkedIn and videos and things like that. And, and it's kind of like probably when you do things when, you know, I don't do as many events as you do in Dallas with the alumni, but when you hear the stories from people that come back to you and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I've had, I've had people come back that read the book, never played the sport of hockey, don't even understand it. And after each chapter, cause you know, you've read it, take your shot. I challenge them and, you know, and they're just blown away. There's like, oh my gosh, dude, I cannot believe how similar we are. You know, really the avatar, the person I'm going after with my book is, you know, is, is a male audience, you know, between the ages of, I'd say 40 and 65. That's kind of the, that's kind of the window of, of, of the gentleman that I think that I'd be moved that I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there's a specific gender for it, but I do believe that that's, who I the readers who are going to gravitate towards this book and recognize things within the book that they've either went through or going through or going to go through that would be the group. Well, the first or one of the first things you mentioned was your dad, and I know what my dad was in in my life, especially growing up as a young kid and busting your balls in the morning, get out of bed, get the you know go skate before school, and you know do things the right way. Uh, talk a little bit about your dad. Uh, I'm sure he probably. Uh, my, my guess is he played a pretty big role in, in in your you know your path. He did. I mean, my dad was my best buddy. I lost him in 2015. Um, it, you know, he's one of, part of the reason I wrote the book as well. You know, my dad was just a big dude, six foot four. You know, two fifty. You know, a huge guy, but he had a huge heart. He was. Um, you know, my dad never said a negative word to me. I mean, he was always, he was your prototypical salesman. When when I'd have a game, he'd say, how did you play? And he'd take out his pen and write down a couple of plays and things like that. My dad really, you know, hey, you know, what do we do now, dad? I, I, I didn't get drafted to junior, you know, let's write letters. Okay, you know, there was no internet then. So we'd sit down and handwrite letters and he showed me and then we mailed them out. And then when Peterborough, Pete said, you know what, we'll take you to camp. I said, what do we do? He goes, well, you hand write letters to all those other teams and thank them. And that was a long summer going back to that mailbox and getting so many letters saying thanks, but no thanks. But that was my dad. <clears throat> you know, my dad was a humble guy, a successful businessman, but he went through his own issue. He had his own issues as a kid. You know, he had a lot of growing up to do as well. I mean, you know, most of my lessons when I was young was learned at the racetrack. He was a huge handicapper, amazing with thoroughbreds and things like that, you know, it's like he'd say things like, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's not the size of the horse, it's the size of the fight in the horse, or how many, you know, all these different things in relation. And he was a good pool player as well. And I used to go watch him play snooker, and he'd say, "It's not what you make, it's what you leave." There's so many life lessons which were kind of neat that he taught me. But everybody loves his name was Big Jack. Everybody loved Big Jack, but <clears throat> it got to a point in my career where when I started to become a fighter, which I, I realized that that was a role I had to fill. <clears throat> and that was a role that was going to allow me to live out my dream that he'd say, how come you're fighting so much? And sometimes he'd get the games that already be kicked out. And that's one part of my journey that my dad couldn't help me in because he's never been there. And that dad never played hockey up to a, uh, up to a young age. He got polio. So one polio set into his leg, so one leg was shorter than the other. So when I was old enough to reach a, the handles of a, a lawnmower, I was pushing it or shoveling. That was what I did as a young, young boy in growing up in Canada. You know that being in Wisconsin, Luds, that was my job. But anyways, so my dad was with me until he kind of couldn't be. And right to the end, right to the end, I wrote the book and he was, um, I was in the process of finishing it before I, you know, in 2015, <clears throat> before I went on to completely finish it 19 he said to me and he grabbed my hand he goes man i just it's it's a shame it's a shame you know what you kind of went through because he knew what, I, what my battles were and things like that and i said to him i i just said to him i said it's 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 good because dad's favorite saying was this too shall pass and it's in the bible this too shall pass and i said to dad i said dad this too shall pass and then here we are four years you know, or, or 2019 when I get back in and that. So I know he'd be proud of this book and, and, and everything uh, because without my father, I definitely couldn't have made it uh, to the NHL. Well, before you get to the NHL, you mentioned Peterborough and Peterborough's a, you know, 
big junior program, obviously, especially in Canada, obviously, yep. right? Did you did you was there even more pressure going to play for a junior team where you know you're not not everybody's knocking your door down to come play for you? And and in that and in that same vein, did you go in there going? I'm going to be a goal scorer. I'm going to put some points up or I'm going to have to fight my way to get into the, or make this roster. It's funny. You know, I didn't know fighting was a huge part of it at that point. I was just playing junior B. I was actually, I was a defenseman at the time. I was forward my whole youth hockey. And then I went to defense cause, cause I, I had, uh, I went through a growth spurt and <laughs> I lost my legs big time. So my dad's <laughs> like, why don't you play defense? And what's funny about this is I did the same thing to Colton. He went through the same thing, except he stayed as defense, thank goodness. Um, and uh, so I went to Peterborough as a defenseman, and then they put me back forward. No, I just think I was going to be a big – because I was, a, you know, I was in youth hockey. I could I was scoring a lot of goals. So when I went to Peterborough, I thought, well, no, I'm going to still chip in. And my last year I did. I, you know, I, I had some decent points and, and did, did some – and if you look at my stats, even in the playoffs, I did good. But, I mean, I went to a team with a whole bunch of NHL guys. I mean, that, that team that I – when you're talking about Luke Richardson, Jody Hall, Chris King, Ty Domi, Mike Ricci, Kay Whitmore, Ron Tugnett. I mean, we were loaded with NHL guys and offensive guys. We had a ton of them, first-rounders. So, really, in Peterborough, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're always put on the fourth line. And that's kind of when I really understood more about fighting, I think – the Western Hockey League is totally different than the Ontario League in, in that respect. I think at 15, guys get thrown into the Lions and it's sink or swim. I don't. The Ontario League isn't wasn't like that as bad as the Western Hockey League was. Well, you mentioned some of those guys and you mentioned first rounders. Uh, in your book, I believe there's something about the NHL draft. What what happened at the draft? Yeah, so I had Luke Richardson, Jody Hall. Um, who else? There were a bunch of them that were, you know, Luke went in the first round of Toronto. There, there's a bunch of them that got dropped. I think Jody Hall went in the first round as well. I, me and my dad got there early. You know, dad, this is back then, you know, for, for your listeners. It's not like it is now. Everybody, you know, you, you went to, like it was in Detroit. And if you had a chance, everybody went to the draft, you know. So the night before we went to the draft and dad being a businessman, always wanting to be there. We got to the draft first and, you know, this is, you know, everybody's getting set up. Uh, I, I think this is even before TSN. I'm not sure. But anyways, we went to the draft and all the first rounders sit down low and. And I had an agent, which I couldn't find at the draft. <laughs> he was he was probably <laughs> hiding from me. Uh, but anyways, we sat there. And like I said, we sat there for about nine rounds. And uh, I had previously went to a, a here on hockey skating school with a lot of the New York Rangers players. And Esposito was there. He was a GM at the time. And he had uh, I had caught his eye. And he said, yeah, if you're ever looking for a tryout or you're looking for a camp, then, you know, we'd love, love to have you. So I went to the draft and sat through nine rounds of not hearing my name. And I just popped up out of my seat and I heard a draft name. And my dad's like, where are you going? I said, I'll be back. And I marched down the stairs. I wasn't in the lower section. We were in the higher section. And I went to the, to the um, you know, so, that, so for your listeners, the draft is set up on the you know, ice surface. There's carpet down there. They still kind of sometimes have the boards around there for the most part, but they have all the tables set up and all the, you know, all your scouts and everybody are at each table. And of course, you have the stage where all the first rounders will get up there and put the jersey on. So they announce your name. So when they announce the name, I just went down and I think most people thought they, I was a draft pick. I was wearing a suit. I'm a young kid. I walked past the security guard. He gives me a big smile. But I walked over to the Rangers table and I tapped uh, Esposito on the shoulder. And he just kind of turned around and, and uh, I go, Mr. Esposito, I go, it's Billy Heward. I was at your Huron hockey camp. I'm with the Peets. And you had mentioned if I don't get drafted or if draft, you know, you'd, you'd uh, allow me to come try out. And he, he took, for sure, he forgot who I was. Well, I thought he did. But anyways, he goes, you got, you know, he kind of said, oh, Billy, Bob made some short. All the scouts at the table are looking at me like, oh, is it, did we draft this kid? Who is he? And uh, anyways, uh, Espo said, yeah, I'll give you the tryout. So I just went, said thanks. He goes, get, get, get in touch with us in the next few days, and we'll coordinate, you know, for the camp and flights. 
So I uh, headed back up the stairs, and my dad goes, what the hell was that all about? I said, I don't know. Let's go home and tell mom I got we got what we needed. So that was that was my draft. So I was thrilled when they came up with this, you know, only so many people allowed to go to the draft. And because it really was, it's hard if you're sitting there. And you're. And I sat through the Junior A draft as well. So that was the second time I sat through through such an event. Yeah, and when you talk about the lower level and the upper level, the lower level is obviously where all the cameras are typically mm -hmm. nowadays, especially. Those are the ones that go on real early. And when you talk about upstairs, those are the ones that usually aren't going at all. That doesn't happen anymore. Right. So, yeah, you're, it's kind of like being being in the back uh, row at church. Right. You know, the, right. the, 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 the kind of sit back there yeah. and let's hope somebody sees us. So, so okay, so explain your – talk about your minors. So you, you get in there, you get to try out. Yep. And uh, you got to play. I mean, most guys do. I mean, I don't think there's many guys around the league to, that don't play in the minors. Uh, you got to get your you got to get your feet wet. Uh, how how is that experience? You know, as you get into the minors and then moving into your first NHL game. Yeah. Um, well, I ended up overall going to fifth. I'm probably the only player NHL alumni that went to 15 training NHL training camps in 12 years. Don't even. Have, I don't even want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere a couple of years. But anyways, yeah, I ended up going to the East Coast League. I was uh, trying out in uh, – there was a league called East Coast League I had no clue about. And I was trying out in Flint and Donnie uh, – Kalamazoo or wherever it was. And Donnie uh, – Don Waddell was there. And he's like, yeah, well, we got – you know. So back then, most of the guys in the International League and the minors were owned by NHL team. So they were all under contract. I was a free agent. So anyways, he said, uh, there's a league called East Coast Hockey League. And, I'm, you know, being from southern Ontario, I wasn't sure about Carolina. I didn't even know about these states. I never went that far. I never got on an airplane to my first NHL training camp. It wasn't like it is now. So anyways, I ended up going to North Carolina in the East Coast Hockey League. Uh, a league at the time uh, had five teams. One owner owned four of them. Uh, we get there. My dad's like, hey, I just bought some property in Sumner, Carolina. If you want to ride, I'll drive you out there and drop you off. It doesn't work out. I'll pick you up. So him and his buddies jumped in the van. They went and picked up a ton of beer and got their cards out. And I drove the van. They played cards. They dropped me off in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And it was pouring rain that night. I'll never forget. It's kind of like, see you later. I'll pick you up if, if need be. Give me a shout. And a banging on the back door, and I got in. And as soon as I get into the rink, it's like a smoke-filled arena. And I'm coming from the best junior organization in Ontario at the time, in my opinion, anyways, Peterborough Pete's. And um, full-on brawl. Welcome to the jungles, Blair. And I'm like, what the hell is this? This is a gong show. So anyways, um, uh, after the game, the coach says, hey, uh, go get your equipment. The trainer's here. we got to go to Knoxville. You stay back here a few days, and then when we come back, we'll get you on the ice. I'm like, sure. So the guy opens the back door and he brings me outside and it's pouring rain, like I said, and there's a tractor trailer. He slides open the tractor trailer door, gives me a garbage bag and gives me a flashlight and says, hey, get, grab your gear. And I'm thinking, dude, I got to tell you, that was that was a moment in my life where I'm like, my, at the time, my dad owned a heating and air conditioning company. And he always said, if you ever want a job, this is always going to be here for you, you know. And I'm sitting in that trailer going, oh, my gosh, dude. And I'm ready for a nervous breakdown going, are you kidding me? Like the shit, the, the gloves and the smell and the must. And I'm just like, well, it is what it is. I got You know, I've made it this far. You know, I, I'm not saying I owed it to my dad, but we've been through a lot. I'm certainly not going to give up now. And uh, long story short, we, we went, on, went on to win the championship that year which is in the book, Carlson, one of the Hansons, shut the power off in our, in our, in our rink in Winston-Salem, so we had to win at Game 7 in Johnstown. Uh, and then I went on to the American Hockey League. And, and as I went further, you know, in the East Coast League, I put up some really big numbers, but the talent wasn't quite there. But I had a lot, you know, in terms of goal scoring and things like that. I had some good fights as well. I was just learning to kind of own in that skill. But in, in that league, you know, what people don't understand is, yeah, I mean, in the NHL, you have to win most of your fights to stay, I, I would say. In those leagues, you got a lot of guys that didn't win a lot of fights, but they like to fight a lot. And they're older guys, and they're guys that are down there still making a living doing that. So now the East Coast League's really a development league. Back then it wasn't. So I kind of, you know, thrown into the fire and did really well in that aspect of the game. But more so, I was putting up some points. And then, and then came the NHL training camps with New Jersey, 
and then um, and then really essentially getting a defined role in the in the East, in the American Hockey League and becoming a, a legit heavyweight fighter. Well, so how when did you have to come to terms with it, and 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 how did players get tagged enforcers? You, you know, I mean, like uh, in your mind, I I think you cross a bridge at times and go, "This is who I am." I mean, it, for me, you know, I was back in college, and I I had Rick Wilson, who you know, former coach in Dallas, and um, Gino Gasparini, and I was told fairly early in my college career, probably game two. This is who you are. This is who you're going to be. See that guy over there? You're not going to be him. And which is a completely different role what we're talking about right now than being an enforcer. So when when do you get to that point where you go, this is what I've got to do and th this is what I'm going to do? And and how, does it come easy to you? I mean, the hunger to stay in the league obviously is what drives you. But how was that moment? Or when was that moment? <clears throat> I think it was like my third training camp. I was trying out. It was our second training camp. I was end up end up one of those years. I did at one camp. I went to another. I was in Rochester, and John Van Boxner called me in the crowd so to sit down, and he said, "And I and I wasn't fighting, you know, <clears throat> only if I absolutely had to, but I wasn't definitely wasn't getting engaged like I should because of the fear. I was terrified, and." Uh, and uh, he said, look, kid, if you, you know, and at least he was honest with me. And uh, and he said, look, if you want to play at this level, the way you play and where you're needed, you know, don't forget the NHL's got the best players in the world, in the world, you know, on the first three lines. You know, in the, in the American Hockey League, in the American Hockey League, you run 10 forwards. So you have to be a decent player. You, you know, you can't afford to have just a guy out there skating around that can't bend his knees. You have to have uh, guys that aren't liabilities. So in the American League, you can kind of get away with it. But in the NHL, you had a fourth line that was kind of designated for that. You didn't have to be as good a player. But John Van Boxmeer had said, hey, you have, you know, this is, this is what, if you want to make it. But I'll tell you a lot of story. I don't, I shared in the book. And I won't say his name, but there was a player in Utica, uh, New Jersey's farm team at, at the time. It was a big, a big strong defenseman, kind of um, six foot four. Wasn't, you know, kind of a little little offensive, but more defensive. But he would fight a little bit in, in the minors. And I remember one day I got to the rink early and um, – and we used to listen through the coach's room in the back. You know, you've, I'm sure you've done that in the past where you kind of can hear your coach. And we had a coach, Tommy McVee, was an old school coach. I love Tommy. And um, I heard him and he said, uh, I'll just say the name, whatever, David. And, he, and, he, and I heard him say, David, how did you think you played? And because David and he was there early. I seen his equipment. So when you get sent back to the NHL from the minors, you'll see the guy's bag sitting there, you know, because he got sent back. And he was up there for 10, 10 games. We watched him. Back then, we didn't have TSN. We watched him on ESPN, too, at the time. And we were cheering him on. You want to see your buddies play in the NHL and get, and get out of the American League. So I just remember, and I would, and, and we, you know, David, how do you think you played? And I heard David say, you know, I did this and did that. And what else did you do? And he said, I did this and I did that. And he goes, well, did you fight? And, uh, and he goes, well, and then it's like, why the fuck? Why didn't you fight? You know, and he just ripped into him. And he was right. Tommy was right because he's trying to tell him, dude, if you would have just stepped up, you would have, you know, you would have stayed. You have you have what you need. You just need that. They needed that element of the game. And that's when it really hit me. I'm just like, and that's what I told my dad, because a couple of days later, my dad came up to watch and I had, I don't know, two or three boats. And uh and my hands were all swollen. My mom, my mom never watched. She would walk the foyer. She couldn't stand when I fought. But anyways, that's when I told my dad, "No, dad, it's this is cut and dry," you know. And and it wasn't so much that I, I real. I kind of I always knew it, Luds. I knew that's what I the way I played. I knew I was going to eventually be faced with this. But how was your dad with that? He, how was your dad when you told him that? Oh, uh, he it didn't sit well with him because he knew I was a good hockey player. He, knew, he didn't understand it. Like I said, he never played that level. You know, like if that happens today, me and you could, you know, your boys obviously are graduated and moved on from pro hockey. But, you, you know, you had that conversation, that hard conversation with him. And I couldn't have it because my dad's never experienced it. So and I didn't have any faith or anything. I didn't have nobody, n nothing to fall back on. So I was just 
a big dude that loved to run guys over, can put the puck in the net. And nowadays, I could play all day long and answer the bell every once in a while. And, you know, the game's changed to where I would love to play nowadays because it's spontaneous. Mm-hmm. It just happens. It's not a pre premeditated. But, um, and that's when I knew. And, and that's when it started to, you know, in terms of in terms of my anxiety and things like that, that's when it started. And it just continued, you know. Okay, so you use the word premeditated. So uh, kind of talk about coming into game day. And, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming you're going to play Hartford. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to play Chicago. You're going to play Boston. And you've got the list. And, you know, we all go through the lineups of other teams and things like that. You going through lineups is way different than than Mike Madonna going through lineups, right? So um, if Mo ever did, I don't think he ever had to. But... But how is it coming into game day? Is it, it does it start the night before? Does it start two days before? Do you are you because I I talked to Nux about this, Chris Nyland, and Nux slept like a baby, but he's wired differently. I mean, we all know that. Hey, Nux is and, and but but how how was it for you leading up to game days? Uh, you know, like night before, day mm-hmm. before, or on the game day of the game? Yeah, no, that's good. And you made a good point. You know, a purpose worth fighting for is my story. And that's one thing I'm clear to point out is not everybody went through what I went through. And just like, you know, and I, and, and Nux didn't go through it. Uh, he, he, I think he had his own demons later on, but it definitely wasn't anxiety from fighting because he was a tough guy. And, and it seems to me like he embraced the role. Well, I mean, we all grew up differently. We were all wired differently to your point. For me, it depended. Like, I mean, when I fought Twist uh, and in Dallas, when I was with the Stars, and I did really well, and I and I took and I and I believe I beat him in that fight. His first game back was against us, if you remember, in St. Louis. And I remember McGinnis telling or McGinnis or or no, uh, knew his buddy, uh, not Al McGinnis. Maybe it was. Anyways, telling him, "Hey, Twister hasn't slept. He's ready." And and his first game is against us. So for you know, three months, I'm not, you know, I'm not sleeping. I know that game. I circle those games. And the same was in the minors was the same when we played, uh, you know, Rangers farm team, Domi, Rudy Pocha, you name it, they were loaded. But so uh, on a game day, so we would fly in that, you know, the night before we'd all go for dinner, you know, we'd have a couple bottles of wine. I would just have some beers and some wine just to kind of just get my mind off of it. But Every time it would come up, who do they got? Who do they got? And it'd always be brought up from guys that weren't fighters for some reason. They like to talk about it. The fighters really didn't want to. So we talk about it at dinner, and we'd go back. And at the time, my room in Dallas was uh, was was actually Mo. So you know, Mo would look to your point. You know, Mo had his own challenges. You know, he's getting paid seven million bucks a year to put the biscuit in the basket. And if he's in a slump, he's got his own issues to deal with. He certainly doesn't have time for my issues. And so. Um, the game, you know, in morning skate, we would get to the rink and I would bar- have barely slept. We'd get to the rink and the visiting team would be out there. And and now this is going, not now, this is going back when I played and, we, and you played. And you'd see all the tough guys. They had three or four heavyweights, most teams. You know, if we went to Michigan, Detroit, you know, you'd see Kosher, you'd see Proby. <laughs> you know, if we went, it didn't matter what team you went to. If it was Philly, there'd be Brownie, you know, and you're the tough guy. And everybody's on the glass and you're seeing what, you know, in, in the NHL and in, in, in your morning skates, you know, you have your, you know, let's you have your red jersey, which is your number one line out there. You'd have the green jersey, which would be the second line. You'd have the blue and then the gold line. And the gold line would typically be the line that I would be on and or the fourth liners. And that's the line that I would focus on because those are the guys you know, and depending on the game and depending who the coach was, if it's St. Louis and Mike Keenan's a the coach, then that gold line is going to be playing, you know, uh, to set the tempo. Because back then, as you're aware, hockey, you know, intimidation was played a major, major role in the sport at that time. It was huge in terms of marketing, in terms of the gate, and in just terms of, of the play. So... I would see who the tough guys were, and then it would start in my stomach. I would already, I would head in, grab my coffee, and start with my tums. And then the coaches that I, you know, there was coaches that would tell me in the morning skate, Huey, you're in. Those are the coaches I would be thankful for. But there are a lot of coaches that wouldn't tell me. So I would have to go the whole day anticipating I'm playing because 
which was hard. If you're not wired that way, if I'm not Chris Nylon and I'm Billy Hewart, it's a whole different deal in my head. It's it's the anxiety. Uh, you know, I got a. I, you know, I'm watching fight videos. That, you know, and you're hearing from the other guys. Oh, Huey, this guy's tough. I he played in the Western Hockey League. You know, he throws heavy lefts and this and that. And I would try and watch as much video as possible. But you know, when you're sitting in the room and you're there quiet, and I used to try and visualize. I'd go to the bench when other guys are visualizing. You know, Luddy, I'm sure you know you're visualizing. You're, you you played against the best players in the world every shift. That was your job to shut them down. And Mo's vision visualizing putting the bisque in, in the basket, I'm visualizing, am I tying a left, am I going right? And that's kind of how I would prepare uh, for for my fight, for the game. And that was, you know, I would be sitting there, so I would watch you and Carbo and Maddie and them going for your PK talks. Then I would watch the power play guys all go in for their separate chats with the coaches. I didn't have that. Fighters didn't have that. We were just there. And, and 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 I remember like Greg Adams tapping me or Nui Huey, you okay, man? You know, there were certain guys, and and I know you did as well, that knew the pressure that was on us guys, those tough guys, and and that was my, my we had a we, that's why I say in the book we are our own fraternity. We didn't we weren't in those meetings, you know. My goal really, Luddy, was to hopefully make a name for myself where that I could become a more of a player. And a lot of guys did that. Al Secor did that. Even Proby did that. He, you know, I think he made it. To, and Nux, I think, even went to the All-Star game. There's certain guys that got to talk it, that cut, you know, that, that did really well. But you have to have a coach, and you have to be in an organization that believes you can do that. If not, you get pegged. Well, was it... Was it easier for you, Huey, if it, if, uh, if speaking of the day of or the night before, was it easier for you to to get some rest if it was somebody that you had fought in the past, whether it was in the minors or two to three weeks earlier, or it didn't really matter? Did it still weigh on your mind or if you had uh, a previous bout with them that you, you had a little bit more to, to grab on to going into that, that particular game? Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, you know what, lads? <clears throat> Things change so much, and anybody can win a fight. And at the NHL level, I mean, I remember when I had, you know, for instance, one year I fight Brashear and I do really good. The next year, he, he grabs me and, and he just flings me around. I don't know what happened over the summer. <clears throat> Maybe he was saucing it. I don't know. But either way, so you don't know. You know, anybody can land a punch. I do know this. When you've been hit really, really hard by a punch, and I mean legit deja vu like I have, you're, you don't care how big, you're not anxious to fight that guy again. I remember when Dean Chanel put me in the hospital and I had plastic surgery on my eye, I, I wasn't anxious to fight him again. You know, and he wasn't a super heavyweight, but it, I did good mm -hmm. against Twist. That didn't matter. I was still shit in my pants because I know his first punch set my helmet in the stands. Like, it's just to that point where, you know, you're always thinking the worst. You know, when you're anticipating, the anticipation and the buildup, it's like public speaking, is always worse than when you when you actually perform the duty. So the fight was 30 seconds, but it could have lasted three weeks. I remember, Luddy, when the NHL schedule come out in the summer, I'd be at my lake house fishing looking at it, circling those games. That's how much it affected me. When I retired... For two years, I woke up in the middle of my nights and in fights, and my wife's like, are you okay? So it definitely had played a role in my life. Oh, what what in, in, your, in your own mind, what establishes a win, a tie, or a loss? How, how do you go? I mean, do you have to drop the guy in order for it to be a victory for you? Or are there different levels that you came out of there? And I'm sure it has a lot to do with the opponent. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. fighting Probert versus Sean Avery, it's a little different, right. but, but I'm just saying, do you, do you have different ways you, you, you grade how you did in that particular fight against that, that player? Not really. I mean, for me, not really. I, I just think I fought a certain style. I threw both hands. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I mean, you always want to, you always want to win the fight, but <clears throat> sometimes if you can just hold your own against certain players, that's perfectly fine as well, because like I said, anybody can win a fight. So, I mean, the, anticip the anticipation was worse than the fight itself. So if I'm fighting Proby, I'll tell you what was harder for me was going into Chicago and fighting Proby, turning the game around, winning the game, 
And then two nights later, we're playing the Rangers, and I'm not in the lineup because I'm not really needed. They don't have a tough mm. guy. Yeah. That was hard yeah. to deal with. And, and that was things that I didn't understand at the time. I didn't because I thought it was all about me at the time. Looking back, and we'll get into that, things have changed. Well, you know, the big thing for the NHL over the past, I don't know, 10 years or so as far as trying to get that part of the game, uh, that part out, um, was what they, they tagged them, stage fights. And so, and you guys know, I mean, if, if you're playing against Twister, you're playing St. Louis, and I mean, you pretty much know what's going on. Is there is there the moment in the game where you go now, or was it in warm-up? Or did you wait for a particular point in the game where, where your club is dead and it needs some life? And regardless, it, I mean, did you, if your team was playing well and and you, you've got the lead, for instance, your, your, team, your club is playing well and Twist invites you, do you walk away from it at the time? Because today... Not again. Not that that happens a lot. It's like we have that with our U18 guys. They they don't understand the momentum. They don't understand the changes in in games. And there's times where you you know um, I'll just let them go, and because that's part of you know their development and everything else. But there's other times you got to go. Hey, dude, like we're up three to one. We don't need them to gain any momentum out of possibly you you know. And again, they don't fight that much either. But but you know what I'm talking yeah. about. So did did that ever come into play? Um. I mean, really, fighters fighters really don't – it's a lose-lose for fighters because if you're on the bench and we're in St. Louis and we get up two goals, we get up one goal, <clears throat> we're stoked. I'm stoked. We get up two goals, that's good. We get up three goals, now now my ass starts to tighten. Now I'm thinking, okay, this things are going to happen now. I'm, something's going to happen. And sure as shit, I go on the ice – and all I hear is, let's twist again. You know what I mean? I hear the crowd. I hear, I know he's coming. <clears throat> and Tony's thinking the same thing. If we get up two goals, we get up three goals, or they get up two goals, they get up three goals, that's my role. So unless it's an absolute blowout, most tough guy, most of us kind of had, you know, most of us knew that we had to do it. First of all, we all wanted to do it early and get it over with so we could play the game. We didn't. Most guys are feeling the same, the, the same stress. That's why guys are like, how do you, you guys are talking after. I mean, it's like, good fight, good fight. It's like, it's over. It's like, oh, you know, I, I, I survive without cracking my head open or my nose or my cheekbone, my orbital bone, my jaw's not broken. I, I've hit a lot of guys. I remember when I, I hit Jimmy Nill once when, when he, and I watched his cheekbone crush in, in the minors and, and I just felt for him. You know, I know the pain of, of, of either giving a punch or receiving a punch and, that's that's why I don't think you know we we really yeah if we win the game and I turn the game around awesome but that's my job that's what I get paid to do that's what I signed up for right but that doesn't make it any easier and it's nice being the hero at times and the fans that's one thing that was nice mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say <clears throat> I'd be crazy to say it to to get at least enjoy some of that while you did it was awesome to be the guy I mean you know churls and you know most tough guys are fan fight favorites Ty and them. But that definitely doesn't alleviate a lot of what we went through. And like I said, in my life, <clears throat> when we got up two or three goals, I knew it was going to happen. Very rarely, you know, you know, or if you're playing a road game and you get out and your coach starts you, you know that you're out there to lay some bodies out and it's going to happen. So that was it. But the days of the premeditated fights are gone. And I'm glad. I, I do believe, I strongly believe there's a role for fighting in the NHL. I just, you have to. It's such an intense sport. If things get heated up, if not, you're going to have guys take guys' heads off with their sticks. Nothing I, I can't stand more nowadays than a cross-check to the face like these guys are doing. I just can't believe it's happening. <clears throat> so I do believe there's still a role, but not the role that we played. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Charles. Uh, my, that's my roomie. So I have oh, okay. Charles forever. Yeah. And we could, uh, we could, oh, I could write a book. Charles and I could co-write a book on the post-game activities yeah. with him and I. So, um, and pre-game. But I noticed that the year in Dallas here, we had Darian Hatcher, we had Shane Churla, uh, Grant Marshall, yourself, and at the end of the season, you had played fifty some games that year. I'm not sure if the other guys, but you had 176 pimps. So you you led the way. 
in penalty minutes. Is there is there anything there, especially with Charles? You know, I mean, Charles was more that guy. Hatchy Hatchy could fight anybody, and he didn't. I don't think Hatch wanted to fight all the time. It was just another tool in his toolbox. D- did you? Is there anything that says I want to be that guy at the, at the end of the season with when it comes to penalty minutes? Is there anything there I want to be above? Charles is your guy. He, he plays. He, he's he's not a heavyweight, right? And I, that's why I give Churro. Yeah. I, I love that guy, and he you give him so much credit for the, the, the guys that he's taken on. Um, is there anything like that that you know? I mean, like you know, Madonna and uh, uh, I don't know Joe Newendike going at it. Somebody you know, one guy wants to have forty five goals, the other guy wants to make sure he has forty six. Is there anything in there for for yourself? Not. I, I wasn't one of those guys. There, there were guys, but the problem with that is it's you know if you get guys the ten yeah, minutes. I mean. To me, yeah. it wasn't about that. I mean, first of all, I didn't love the role. So I didn't really, I didn't want to, you know, I mean, in the American League, I think I led the league 359 minutes one year or something like that. But yeah, that's what it uh, was. And that was, but I think we used to count majors. But to me, it was quality versus quantity. Like who, who, who was he fighting? You know, like I remember there were certain guys that would fight anybody. Well, I mean, when I would fight, I was fighting heavyweights. Yeah, if you look, if you if you look at the, the folks that I fought, and I had a really good high winning winning percentage, it was heavyweights. And I, I fought a few guys like Kiprios or certain guys like that, but for the most part. So, but I, I gotta. Can I share? I want to share with your audience a story about Churla and how I and, and, and are, you you want to talk about that now about Churla, or my story with Shane? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you guys came into Ottawa. And Charles, I think he was Minnesota or maybe, yeah, Dallas, I think it was actually your first year. And Darcy Walk, Walklock, is it? Darcy, the, the Walk-Lock. yeah, Walkie yep. was yep. a goalie. Walk-Lock. And yep. Charles went to Walkie and said, hey, you know, who's this Hewitt kid? And, and Walklock's like, because Walklock seen me fight in the minors when I used to just throw rights before I screwed up my right hand. He didn't know I had switched to left. So anyways, he told Charles, and Charles tells the story the best. I seen him at an event in Chicago not too long ago, and he, he still brings up the story. So he tells Charles, oh, he, he's all right. If you type his right, it's no problem. So we dropped the gloves, and he grabs my <laughs> right, which was a big mistake, and I, I closed his eye with my left, and he left, <clears throat> he left the ice. So when I got signed with Dallas, Charles came up to me and goes, hey, Never listened to a goalie. We had a good laugh over that one because <laughs> Charles me and him played on the same line for a while. And and, and you're right, um, Charles was a tough guy. And, and you know, I'll never forget. You know, one thing that saddened me in the NHL and, and why there should be fighting, in my opinion, is when I think it was Burray or somebody had just leveled him. Yeah, that was like shit yep. like that. That's the other thing with tough guys. Nobody, yep. a, a, a guy, a non-fighter could get away with certain things like that. And it was just, it, it was a joke to me. But, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't a big stats guy. I mean, I think the one year I had six goals, six assists, and we didn't play a lot. You know, if you're not in the power play and you're not playing a lot, it's hard to, it's hard to put points up. But I was, I definitely wasn't that guy that looked to get three, four hundred minutes. Uh, there are those guys, I just wasn't one of them. Yeah, and like I said, you know they they get to them numbers a lot of times by getting the extra ten, and you know uh, so uh, that's just not for me. But um, let's talk about uh, with all of that comes injuries, Huey. And I know you mentioned your one hand, but can you can you take us down the road of of the injuries that that you've gone through and and maybe how that's kind of ha- has affected you uh, since you quit playing? Sure. Yeah. I mean, during my during my career, I have pins and screws in my wrists. I had major surgery on my left eye, uh, uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, Dr. Cooper did that. Um, MCLs, uh, but uh, lower back, but I had a lot of sur- hands or several hand sh- surgery, screws and, and pins in my hands. Uh, my hands deformed now, my left hand. Um, but I would say that, um, I'm going to pause this lot. Can you hear this tinging leads at your end? No, you can. He can, he can cut out whatever okay. you get, we so can do. So I would, uh, let's get you ready. So I would say that, uh, yep. um, more than that, I, I had, uh, issues with my head more than anything. I just think from the concussions I received playing pro hockey, not just in the NHL, but I played 12 years overall. And, uh, I, uh, I'll tell you a story. I had, we had, I had, uh, started a company. We sold the company in 2019, 
and we were out celebrating, and I had my family with me, my kids, and I had started getting a lot of anxiety uh, and, and bouts of depression and things, and for no reason, really, uh, I was doing really well, financially stable, had a great job, you know, and things like that. And uh, one time we went out for dinner, and I ended up having a, uh, a bit of a nervous breakdown for no reason at all. I just started crying and sobbing, and my wife said, what is going on? So I left. I left. The kids were worried, obviously, and they're older at the time. So I left the restaurant and gathered myself and went back in, and she's like, what was that? I'm like, I have no idea. Z absolutely no idea. I've never experienced that. And then progressively got worse and worse and worse. And um, and we had. Is there something that was going through your mind that 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 you initially started crying? I mean, or there was just nothing. nothing and you just started... nothing. It was like it was it was unbelievable. Hmm. It just hit me. It was just like a it's just like a wave of sadness. Just my emotions. It's almost like it just got my emotions. Just like if you lost your your best friend or you something, you know, just absolutely crushed you and you just can't, uncon, uncontrollable. I've never felt such a thing. It's kind of like when you laugh and you're, and you're, you know, enthusiastic, but it's, but it's way worse. And that's what had happened to me. Um, so it got worse and worse. And in our NHL uh, settlement, we had um, the NHL, when we settled the, the concussion lawsuit, um, really, more than anything, I signed up for that. And, you know, all I, the only reason I ever did it, obviously, it wasn't for, finan for, for financial reasons at all. It was just so if I leave the house one day to go get some groceries and I don't make it back, uh, uh, hopefully there's some, you know, there, there's something um, financially in place for my family for what I went through. And the other reason I did it is so I could get some, um, you know, some help, you, you know, and uh, sure enough, I, I went through, I went through uh, the program and seeing, seeing a neurologist and was diagnosed with you know parts of PTSD and things like that, which I knew I had. I, and because I remember in so many fights, you know, when you get that deja vu, I don't know if you've ever had it, Luds, maybe with a big hit or you took a shot or even in a fight, you're in the middle of a fight, everything pauses, you feel like you've been there, and then you just start throwing again and you just pause, and and that's kind of deja vu that 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 and, and like i said for the first few years after retirement i woke up with nightmares of fighting and things so that it, it's embedded in you and one thing about ptsd is you know p people don't know this is most soldiers that get ptsd never never seen action it was the anxiety of being in the action that led to that and, and that has a lot to do with the fighting as well i think the anxiety the anxiety of the fight is just as detrimental as the blow to the head in terms of concussions and things like that and how it works in your mind. And that's what I believe I was I was going through. So anyways, uh, the, the, and I think I believe a lot of ex-NHL players that have went through this are not, no longer with us. I, I truly believe this is probably what was a big part uh, that played a big role in, in them not being with us and are struggling with what I struggled with because really it's hard if you don't go if you haven't gone through it you know it, then you won't understand it and anyways I uh, they put me on a med uh, on a med and he said you know there's a few things you have you know do you drink I said yeah I drink he goes well uh, alcohol is a depressant he said you you have to make that choice but I will tell you this things aren't going to get better so that was one that was just one of the things um, and, and I had wanted to quit drinking for a long time anyways. Drinking really helped, worked when it, when it needed to, when I needed to during, the career, during my career. That was the only thing I could fall back on before I had any faith and things like that. So I think it worked until it didn't work. So that was one of the good things that came from it. But more than that, it leveled me up. I, was, I wasn't going through the peaks and valleys and the ups and downs. And then... I really had to figure things out for myself, and that's when I really got into holistic measures. I really got into other means of of, uh, of healing for me and my and my mind and things like that. That's when I got into cold tubs. I bought a cold tub. I started getting back into getting out the things that the things that made. When I was a kid, I used to hang out in the woods all the time in the wilderness. I just loved it, loved it. I used to go out there with my BB gun, like a lot of kids do. But I would, I would go for, for hours, and I don't know, there's just something about it that's healing for me. And I started doing that during COVID, 
And I just started going back. We have the high Sierra mountains here and things like that. And I just found it so healing. And uh, like I said, I, I got into cold plunging and breathing and things like that. So, I mean, it's a long winded answer, but that's really, that's really, and, and I believe, and it's part of the reason we're talking today is because uh, once I started healing myself mentally and physically and getting in good shape and things like that, I wanted to share it. I wanted to, to reach others, other hockey players, you know, in terms of, you know, like this hat I'm wearing, 22 soldiers a day take their lives from PTSD. It's crazy with the mental, with the anxiety and the depression. And, and a lot of it is guys that are, that have, you know, that are no longer serving and they get into the real world and they go through what I'm going through is what I believe. So but anyways, yeah. And uh, I, I, the main thing is I have it under control. And I'm able to function, run a company and, you know, starting another company and things like that. But thanks to the NHL and the program, I was able to uh, seek refuge and get my life back in order. Yeah, I actually do some stuff with 22 Kill. Okay. And so they're, they're a great organization. I know a bunch of those guys and been some of their, their benefits and things like that. So, um, well... You know, I, I did a podcast with uh, Stephen Johns, and I'm, no, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Stephen, defenseman with Dallas Stars, and ran into you know concussion problems. I, I just I had always felt like Stephen could be just a uh, a big number two defenseman. He could lead the the Stars and hits at the end of the year of shots, and you know we I'm not going to say he was this offensive guy, but he was that guy. I mean, he was a glue guy, and 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 so a lot of the things that you've just talked about is everything that he talked about, he, you know, with the program and the NHL stuff and CTE and, and all that. And, and Steven's doing a lot better. He actually, something similar to you is he went out and, and rollerbladed cross country and to bring awareness to mental health. And um, had one of the guys in Dallas stars kind of videotaped the whole thing. And, and that was his way of, you know, getting himself back and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, what, like, can you can you talk about a couple of the guys like who if, if you had a, a list and whether that's good or bad, do you have a top two or three guys at the time when, when, when you, you know, with with your fights, uh, some whether they're heavyweights or guys that you you didn't sleep as well, uh, uh, you know, or you slept worse, maybe because you said you didn't sleep anyways. But were there other guys that kept you awake more than others? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, at the time, kosher was with the Rangers. Um, when I first broke into the league, it was Brownie, McSorley, uh, Proby, Twist. There were a lot of guys I didn't sleep. Most, most guys I didn't sleep because I wasn't, I wasn't an oversized guy, you know, I'm six foot one fighting, you know, and as a, as a, as, a, as the years went on, the guys got bigger. You know that, I mean, the guy that took my role in Edmonton was George the rock, you know, he's, he's, he's a giant of a man. Yeah. But a mountain, even, yeah. yeah, mountain of a man, and uh, so there were certain guys, there were certain guys that you know that you knew that if you got hit by Twister's punch, and you know you're watching ESPN the night before, and you're hearing how he, you know, absolutely broke someone's jaw or crushed somebody, and you, you know, and he's coming into Dallas Thursday, and that's your job, you know. So, really, for the most part, you know, even Ty, Ty beat me. You know, we were in we were in Toronto playing the Leafs. My parents are in Ty's suite, you know, because we play junior together. <laughs> Ty runs around. I think he ran Churler or somebody. And I, I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Like, I'm the guy. Here we go. And he actually beat me in that fight. He spun me pretty good. But anybody can win a fight, you know. And, like, I can beat Dave Brown. And two nights later, Brown can crush Domi. And then Domi beats me. So it doesn't matter in, in, in the NHL because, you know, you're, you're fighting on two thin blades of steel, and, you know, you just misstep or, or you grab and you're grabbing a loose jersey or, you know, back in those days, guys, you know, guys had Velcro on their sleeves of the jerseys until until Rob Ray uh, continued to pull out of his jerseys. And they came with tie downs. You know, the, we, you know, guys were crafty. I remember when I went to Quebec to the Nordiques, they gave me Twister's jersey, 15. It was a goalie cut jersey with Velcro down the sleeve. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK, yeah, <laughs> good for him. I mean, no wonder. But. No, I mean, for me, Luds, uh, honestly, it really, most of the guys at that level were super heavyweights. Like, it was, they were tough customers. Huey, I want to go back to your buddy, Mo. You guys were roomies. Who actually was cheaper? Well, I mean, everybody thinks it was me, but I, I know one thing. <laughs> I was 
For, uh, <clears throat> I was the guy that always had to pay the bills because Mo didn't want to deal with the fans and all the bullshit at the front of the at the at the, the lobby. So, well, did he pay you back? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let, since we're going down that road, I do recall, and it took took us a while to figure it out. If we went out for dinners, and which we did, I mean, we, we had the the luxury of of not flying home after games and flying to the next yeah. city. We got to spend a lot of time on the road, which I thought always kept teams closer together and blah blah blah. You always seem to pick up the tab, and, and just so people know, you get meal money, and you know whether it's thirty bucks a day, fifty bucks a day, whatever it may be, you get an envelope when you get onto the plane. And so you, you I mean, you go on a good long road trip, you get three, four hundred dollars possibly in in cash and American money, and so we all go out to dinner, and we always at the end of the bit, you get the bill, and everybody, you know, it's a few hundred dollars, everybody chips in their amount, and regardless of what you had, I never thought that was fair either, but but anyway, that's just the way it works you would always seem to pay for dinner in canada so you're not you you weren't as dumb because people understand like they're there and you can go ahead and explain it now it took me a long time to figure it out but you, you put it on your card in canada it's in canadian dollars right you get everybody to chip in american dollars because that's all we ever had in canada so you were making money on the deal weren't you Letty, i'm a businessman it's where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. According, hey, ever since you retired, according to some of your business, you you weren't a great businessman no. all the time, were you? No, you know, you know, the saying is, if you're gonna fall, <laughs> fall on your back, because if you can look up, you can get up, and and that's what you got to do. I don't call, I don't call them failures. I just call them experiments. But yeah, I mean that's yeah, yeah. that's uh, we that was, uh, and not only that, putting other people's dinners on our tabs and paying for them, like. It was crazy though when you think about it back then. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade anything. Obviously, I'd love to be a, you know, to make the money they're making. But the, to have the technology and to not be able to stay in cities like we did, I mean, I would not have given that up for anything. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine that now. Um, I think we played at a special time uh, in, in relation to the NHL and how, you know, in terms of technology and things like that, like now time, like I remember you telling me, I think it was you or Marty telling me, McSorley, one of you guys were telling me, you know, nowadays you're coaching a team and, and they land and they're all looking for Whole Foods to get some big food, you know, like we would look for the bar. They're looking to go to a health food store and things like that, which is a good thing, by the way. Oh, well, I can tell you that real shortly. We were, we got off a plane and we were in Anaheim, I think it was. And, um, <clears throat> You know, I was doing TV or whatever it was with Razor, and we got the plane. And as we were checking in, there were about four or five guys standing around the concierge uh, little stand talking to the guy. And I, I went upstairs and changed and got my my jeans on and came back down and I was going to go have a beer and a couple of places I know, and we we're going to go there. And I just walked, and they're still standing there. And I just I walked up and said, "Hey, you guys, uh, you guys looking for a place to go? What are you looking for? Are you, are you looking for this? Are you looking for that? I, you know, I can tell you where you want to go." And they all kind of looked at me, and I said, well, "What do you guys?" looking for i said well we're, we're we're looking for the closest whole foods <laughs> so i was like oh well. <laughs> so i knew at that moment the game had kind of changed yeah. you know and so that i mean i knew it had and they all take care of themselves so well and that's mm -hmm. why they play so well and all the you know that kind of stuff so again the book is called uh, a purpose worth, worth fighting for and, and here you've done a hell of a job with this book is there anything uh, let's put it this way anything else you want to leave us with about the book and can you tell us the details on yeah. it when it's coming out yeah. so everybody knows what the what the program is here so you know the name i came up with was the purpose worth fighting for i think everybody you know i think the two the two biggest days in your life really are the day you were born and the, and the day you realize why you were born and it took me a long time to figure that out i think you know i always thought my purpose in life was to play in the nhl it was always my dream you know when they asked you in, 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 as a kid in school what do you want to do it was always i want to play in the nhl you know, and I thought that was my purpose in life. Um, and then I went through my journey and I made it and I retired and I realized that I wasn't fulfilled at all. And actually, it was a nightmare for me uh, playing. There were lots of good times, don't get me wrong, but the the depth of the of the of what I went through in terms of anxiety definitely didn't make up for that. So I felt I had been robbed. My purpose had been robbed. And then later on in, in life, 
uh, when I really hit rock bottom, and you read about it in the book, when I was I was at a at a point in my life where I was going to take my life, that uh, I had a couple, um, let's say, aha moments, and one of which is when my dad called me and said, "Hey, this too shall pass," and uh, another one was I had a couple spiritual, you know, what I would consider a spiritual awakening, and um, that changed my course of my life and changed my life. And uh, I became a believer, uh, you know, I, I never really picked up, even though Bob Ganey and um, uh, with Peterborough, Bob Ganey and Roger Nielsen had given us all little Pete's Bibles. And the, and the night I went through this, I went through this transformation, I was, I, I actually found my Pete's Bible, believe it or not. Anyways, long story short was I became, I, I realized that I'm here for a bigger purpose and my purpose wasn't just to play in the NHL. My purpose was to utilize my gifts and, and what 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 God put me through in the NHL to help others. And and I, I look back now, and we played with believers like Bobby Basson and Bosch, and there's a lot of guys that I never really understood. And because I always thought, oh, you know, you know, you got there's something different about them. You always knew there was something different, but you didn't know what it was. And they were great guys. Um, I have to look back now and go, man, had I been a believer, had I had faith, I would have understood that there was a bigger purpose for this role. I probably would have been a tougher guy because I would have been fighting for more than just myself. I would have been like, no, there's a purpose for this because I had nothing to fall back on. I just, there's nobody that said, you, when you're a tough guy, you don't go to Craig Ludwig and Lud say, dude, I'm terrified tonight, man. I really, you know, and and, and if I do, you're going to say, well, that's your role. You know, it's just the way it was. But had I been able to say, hey, God, I don't know why I'm here and I don't know why I'm going through this, but I know you got my back. And I'll tell you why I know it works, because in business and the success I've had, it's all because of that. There's not a business I've gotten into that I have any experience in and I've been successful in in the last 10 years of my life, at least. And it's just through faith. So a purpose worth fighting for is just for others to understand that everybody has a purpose. And, you know, there's cer there's certain folks that really understand it at a younger age or, or you know, or, or live it, you know, are living it. But there's a lot of a lot of us that are going, what am I here for? What am I here for? And most of us, it's because we're looking within instead of how can we help others? And once you start turning that, turning that dial towards others, it, it kind of opens up a little bit. So that's why I wrote the book, A Purpose Worth Fighting For. It's for those folks that are still looking for purpose um, and meaning in life or dealing with mental illness. That's why I get into that in the book. Uh, my launch is September 20th is when I'm going to launch it. We're actually doing a special on, if you go to www.billyheward.com, if you go to the website, you can uh, fill out a form. And uh, on the launch date, Luddy, I'll have you shoot out an email as well at the time. Uh, we're doing, I said, hey, let's just do the ebook for free or for 99 cents. We had to charge, they said. So 99 cents on Amazon and the paperbacks there as well. We don't have the uh, hardcover. It'll be a few weeks. But uh, I encourage you to go there and and or uh, share 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 this podcast. This is an amazing podcast. You know, when you think of hockey and 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 and, and Luddy, I want to talk about you just briefly because I know it's you're it's always about others with, with with you. You know, you're always interviewing us. But I think uh, you know two Stanley Cups, over a thousand games, playing playing against the best, absolute best players in the world. I mean. Folks, you have to, you know, and your fans have to understand what that means in terms of hockey. But in terms of legacy, you know, when I look back, and, and I think when you look back, you know, that Stanley Cup, or, you know, goes goes into the Hall of Fame. I think your stats, you know, you're going to go down in history and University of North Dakota and all that. But I think what doesn't get measured is the charities. And like you said, the veterans and the people that you touch that you don't even know that lives that you changed or your grandkids and your boys, you know, there's certain things. Uh, and to me, a purpose worth fighting for is about that legacy. I think the accolades and winning the Stanley cup or even being in the hall of fame is awesome. And that's why I think tough guys have a certain, we're never going to get there, but where we do make a difference is, 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 is life after hockey. And I think in terms of the uh, Dallas stars alumni and what you've done, you can't measure that. And, um, that to me is everything. And that's, that's the legacy I want to leave. You know, yeah, I have a book. My book really is, is my business card. It's like, you know, I get so asked so many times, you know, what do you do or who is your top? 
here by the book, but really the book is just a vessel for folks to understand why I, I truly believe my purpose was. So long-winded, but um, that, that's really why I wrote the book. 